Okay, to complete today's experiment, we're gonna need a lot of equipment to uh, make sure that we can do this safely. First thing we're going to need is a uh, iron ring stand. Uh, to go with that, you're definitely gonna need an iron ring. Uh, you're also going to need a piece of wire gauze, a clay triangle, a functioning Bunsen burner attached to some uh, gas tubing, a crucible with a lid, a small piece of magnesium metal, and a small strip of sandpaper, as well as a pair of crucible tongs, your normal personal protective equipment, which includes a lab coat, gloves, goggles, and you're gonna need something to light your, light your Bunsen burner with, whether that's a striker or a mirror. Okay, so to start setting up your reaction today, you're gonna need to take your uh, ring stand and attach your iron ring. Go ahead and leave it way up top because we're gonna light a fire under this and we don't want this to get warm until we're ready for it, okay? Uh, next, we're going to uh, uh, take our Bunsen burner, and remember for safety, we always completely close our Bunsen burner whenever we first get it. Then we turn it two big turns on both the bell and the gas inlet. Then we attach it to the gas main. At that point, we're ready to start uh, trying to light the fire. So. Remember, we strike our match and hold it just off to the side and turn on the gas with gusto. Don't be afraid of the gas, okay? As long as you're standing back, you're gonna be fine. Okay. Then we're going to begin doing adjustments until our flame is a stable two blue cones. Okay, now that we've got our two stable blue cones, we're going to bring our iron ring stand back in, place our uh, fire onto the iron ring stand, and we're gonna lower the ring. We wanna lower the ring such that the inner blue cone is just on the inside of the center of the iron ring, okay? Once we've done that, we can start tempering, which remember, tempering means it's We've got a big temperature differential here, so we wanna make sure that things are warm before we stick them in the very, very hot fire, okay? So we're gonna temper our, our clay triangle, then sit that down, and then now we have, a, we have an extra step that we need to do. These crucibles are very, very absorbent. They're very porous. So anytime somebody has touched them with their hands, oils and debris and skin cells and things like that can get stuck to the outside or the inside of your, of your crucible. We need to get that cleaned off and soap and water is not going to help us here because that soap and water can also get stuck in those pores. So we need to figure out a way around that. We've already got fire, so we could just burn it off and that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to take our crucible and we're going to obtain its mass before it's burned. Then we're going to uh, heat the crucible for 10 to 15 minute increments and cool it down and weigh it. And we're going to continue to do that until the difference in the mass of the crucible is very, very, very small. Um, this usually only takes uh, two, maybe three heatings. Uh, today we're not going to show you all of those because that's 15 minutes on the crew, on the fire, and then 10 minutes to cool, a couple of minutes to weigh, then 15 minutes on the fire, 10 minutes to cool, okay? So instead, I'm just gonna show you that we can put our crucible into the heat. Notice I didn't drop it directly onto the hot fire. I'm tempering it, I'm heating it up, I'm warming it, and then I'm going to put it down. Now, notice the bottom of the crucible is directly in that hottest part of the flame. We've got to get this crucible scorching hot. It's got to be hot enough to ignite metal, okay? Uh, once we're uh, on the fire like that, we can put our uh, lid on. We want to set the lid slightly ajar so that we still get some gas flow in there. All of those ashes and soot that burn off can get out and we can start to get a consistent fire on our crucible. 
Okay. So we're going to heat and cool this crucible several times until the mass of the crucible doesn't change after two successive. We have our mat, we have our crucible clean, cooled down. We obtained the mass of the crucible and the lid. We then obtained a small ribbon of magnesium and we took our sand paper. We just lightly went over the exterior of it to take off any residual oxides, any rust, anything like that that's sticking to the outside. Uh, we're going to slightly curl our ribbon. We need this ribbon to sit really tightly against the bottom of the crucible. So we're going to curl it up into a smiley face shape, and then we're going to drop it right into the bottom of the crucible. We're going to lay the crucible with the magnesium and the lid so that we can obtain the mass of the magnesium. Okay? We've done that, and now we're ready to actually start the chemistry portion of this. We need that magnesium to ignite in the presence of oxygen. So we have oxygen all around us, more oxygen than we'll ever use for this experiment. So we have a whole lot, we have an excess, excess reagent of oxygen. We're going to take this magnesium ribbon in the crucible. We're going to gently, again, we're going to temper it. We're going to heat it gently. And then slowly put it back into that hottest part of the flame. Now, when the magnesium ignites, some of the ash from the magnesium is going to try to fly off. We need to catch that. But we still need oxygen exchange. So we can't just set our lid on tight. We need to, again, put our lid on sort of at an angle. That's going to give the airflow to magnesium, but still track all of that magnesium ash, magnesium oxide ash that may fly up away from the magnesium. After this, it's a waiting game. It can take anywhere from five minutes to 45 minutes for that magnesium to get hot enough to, cons to, to spontaneously combust, because that's what we're waiting for here, spontaneous combustion. So we're just going to set this here, leave it great. We're waiting. We're still waiting. What we're waiting for is we're waiting for that flash of magnesium fire. Okay? We'll see a bright light sort of come up out of this thing. We won't see fire, we'll just see a bright light. Once that's happened, we know that the magnesium has ignited. But that doesn't mean that the reaction is over. There's still going to be little bits of magnesium that are going to take longer than others. So what we're going to do is uh, periodically, uh, while it's uh, once it's, we have that bright flash, periodically we're going to come back in and we're going to look every two minutes, and we're going to see if there are any embers growing, just like in a, in a normal campfire. We're going to look for embers. If there are any red glow bits, we're not done yet. We're going to let those continue to burn. Those are still going, so we're waiting. That. So it's ignited, there was a bright white flash, and then a dull yellow light that calmed down to a red glow. We let that red glow go and go and go until the red glow went out. And when we were done, it looked like this. The problem with this is, is that that's not all magnesium oxide. About 70% of Earth's atmosphere is actually nitrogen, not oxygen. And uh, part of that magnesium compound is actually magnesium nitride, uh, Mg3 and 2. That's not what we want. However, there is a solution here. Magnesium nitride in the presence of water will convert to magnesium hydroxide, MgOH2. Uh, 
Magnesium hydroxide can be dehydrated. If I heat it intensely, water will come off of it and will be left with magnesium oxide. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take that magnesium nitride and we're going to add some deionized water to it. Okay? The deionized water is going to um, convert the magnesium nitride to magnesium hydroxide. Then we're going to put it back on the heat and we're going to convert the magnesium hydroxide to magnesium oxide. So first, I don't want to switch any slash heat, so I'm going to move the gas out from under that and I'm going to give this a second to cool down a little bit. Then, I'm going to take one dropper full of water. This is way more water than is actually needed to do this conversion. But I want to make sure that I get it all. It's better to have an excess of one reagent that I can have excess easily than to not have enough. So, I'm going to put my water in here and we're going to notice steam coming out immediately. And just drop by drop, I'm going to add this water to our magnesium compound. Now, that's more than enough water. So my magnesium nitride is now quickly converting to magnesium hydroxide. Give that a second, let that conversion happen. And then now we're ready to convert that magnesium hydroxide to magnesium oxide. We do that by adding P once again. This, this time we're just going to have to time it. There's no visual indicator that the reaction is over. So we're going to heat this intensely for another 10 minutes. During that 10 minutes, that magnesium nitride to hydroxide to oxide reaction is going to happen. When that's over, we now have our final product and we're ready to obtain its mass.